My name is Gail Robos. I'm a professor of medicine, and I run the leukemia program at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian Hospital. I deal with all things myeloid. I was trying to count how many ashes I've been to. I think it's like 197 years at this point. But the it was there was just nothing to talk about in MPNs, and we were in some other building where the popular people didn't hang out. And now it's actually much more of a topic of discussion, so very exciting. I was thinking on the way over here why I really enjoy ASH, and there's so many levels at which we're learning. Um, just what Dr. Robos was talking about just a minute ago. So we, we get to see new data, um, including data that's very early on, like what happened at the plenary session yesterday, which is a very new way to think about um, how we might attack these diseases, some in a way that we haven't done before, just like we heard about, for example, our early JAK inhibitors at the plenary sessions. We also get to meet together in um, sessions that are a little smaller. Um, so when the physicians come to ASH, uh, we get together in these oral sessions and hear about the early results of clinical trials or laboratory-based trials and get to ask one another questions on those and really explore the data in a group setting. Um, ASH is also great because of educational sessions. Dr. Pettit, just here, is leading one of the educational sessions here, which is a great way to disseminate information on MPNs to physicians who aren't necessarily specialists, information to general practitioners, general oncologists, and to our trainees, our fellows, and uh, people that are learning to be oncologists. So it's a great way to take what's really um, something that may be routine for some of the specialists and make sure that the physicians who, who aren't necessarily at academic centers have an idea of what's new and expected uh, in the treatments of these. Thanks for having me. I'm Kristen Pettit from the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting things going on over the past year. Uh, we now have three approved JAK inhibitors for patients with myelofibrosis. We have ruxolitinib, vedratinib, and now pacritinib that was approved uh, in February of this year. And um, likely a fourth, momolotinib, coming um, within the next six months also. So it's great that we now have options, uh, more options for our patients with myelofibrosis. Um, and I think the, um, the next big thing that I'm excited about that we've heard a lot about at this ASH meeting is combination therapies. So the JAK inhibitors um, have been revolutionary for people with myelofibrosis as far as treating symptoms and treating um, uh, splenomegaly, but um, really are, are um, kind of a starting place, I think. And adding other medications in with these JAK inhibitors as kind of the backbone, I think is the next big step. And we saw some really exciting data here at this meeting of some of those combinations with BET inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors and Navitaclax. Um, so I think all of that is really exciting. I think um, we have a lot of work to do to kind of tease out um, kind of which patients are going to get the most benefit from those combinations and when to use which agents and which combinations. So it's kind of a fun place to be right now that we have tools to, um, to work with. This meeting is also a great chance for us to interact with some of the uh, companies that are developing new trials or new agents and give them opinions about what are the right populations to test this new drug in or how should you design this trial so that we really take into account the um, the what's important to the patient. So it's a it's a very valuable time for um, meetings that interact between physicians and companies so that there's some thought processes in the companies as they design this of what really matters to patients. Hi, my name is Linda Riesar. I am a professor at Johns Hopkins, and my laboratory has been studying basic mechanisms that drive progression in myeloproliferative neoplasias. So we focus on a protein, we call it HMGA1, and we found in some experiments that we presented last year at ASH that it is absolutely required for progression in our mouse models and through collaborative studies with uh, friends and colleagues in the MPN field, we find that these same pathways are activated in patients. Um, so this year, um, my graduate student actually won an ASH Achievement Award for his abstract. And in this work, we are identifying mechanisms whereby the leukemia cells hide themselves from the immune system. So we're looking at how MPN cells 
become invisible to our immune system. And we found that um, HMGA is repressing some markers on the surface of the cells as they become more aggressive. So in the chronic phase, these markers on the cells, they're called MHC class two antigens, they're there and our immune system can recognize them. As the, the leukemia develops, the cells become invisible by repressing these markers on the cell. And so in our studies, we found um, that HMGA is a driver of this process. And we've also, I think the most hopeful and exciting part of this is we found some drugs that can reactivate those markers so that hopefully then the immune system can attack the cells before they progress and make our patients sick. Hello, my name is Sari Gafari. I'm a professor in uh, Oncological Sciences at Mount Sinai, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am a physician scientist, but I really do research. In a, I have a lab, and we do research. And um, I felt when you invited me to come here, I was not very sure whether I would fit very well, because what I, I don't see patients. But I think that what we are doing and we are very excited about, it's totally in fitting with everything that I just heard from uh, my colleagues. Um, we have made a major, I would call it a real discovery, and people who are in uh, our uh, field of stem cell biology, but also people who are outside of it, they're starting to pay attention to it, perhaps. Um, and it, you know, these are type of things that are, uh, take a little bit of time to, for people to catch on. It's that we are able to look, to zoom in into the cell and looking at places that can go wrong that are, have not been looked at. And um, places that we are finding, which are places that are really responsible for degradation in the cell, we are finding that there are major things can go wrong with those and they're responsible for the stem cell potency, for their quiescence, and these are um, topics that are of importance to uh, leukemia and to uh, myeloprophetic neoplasms, and uh, we are looking at to see how cell alteration can, uh, and to predict how cells can get altered and to become leukemic and also how to make better stem cells for transplantation. And we are working with chemists and a lot of other type of collaborators that can help us to bring this to the next level to be uh, useful for patients. So I think that uh, gives me more uh, confidence that what we are doing is actually useful and uh, may get us to better places. Hi, I'm Angela Fleischman. Um, I'm from the University of California, Irvine, and I'm a physician scientist focusing on MPN. I'm very interested in both inflammation as well as uh, the familial predisposition to acquire a myeloproliferative neoplasm, and I think that both are quite intertwined. Um, as our uh, hypothesis or idea is that a, um, a chronic inflammation um, may uh, predispose people to acquire an MPN, and the immune system of families with MPN may be a little bit different than normal controls. So we're doing a few different studies. Number one, looking at immune cells from MPN patients, their unaffected family members, and comparing them to normal controls um, on how much inflammation they're, they're um, producing. And what we found is that MPN patients, as well as some of their family members, when they get a stimulus to turn on inflammation, they turn it on, but unlike normal controls, they have difficulty turning it off. So when they, they get the signal to turn on inflammation, they just persistently make inflammation. And another thing that we're, we're building our cohort of um, MPN families um, with a few different um, purposes. Number one, to see whether potentially the unaffected or presumably unaffected family members may harbor some mutations that are also seen in MPN and just not be diagnosed with it yet, um, as well as um, trying to identify potentially some markers um, that predict for development of an MPN. One of the things that I'm actually most hopeful about uh, stems from a little of the work that Dr. Fleischman is doing, and that's the growing understanding of what it is in our environment or our life experience, our behaviors that um, may accelerate the 
what's happening in the bone marrow in terms of uh, predisposing people to diseases of uh, blood or blood cancers. Um, there's been some really interesting work on the role of inflammation, like Dr. Fleischman talked about. And when I think about things that are helpful I, or hopeful, I think about like getting in at the beginning and uh, maybe being able to prevent some of these things from taking off or being so able to measure them at such um, early levels that we can intervene before it becomes a problem. So when I'm, um, I'm really hoping that eventually we can make some of this science um, quite, um, quite useful early on in, um, before people develop disease, um, just to maintain health instead of treat illness. My name uh, is Jean Palmer. I'm at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, and I focus uh, clinically on MPN and uh, bone marrow transplant. And I would say over the last year, I mean, I think there's a couple things that are really exciting. Um, first of all is, you know, ongoing discussions on how we determine the appropriate timing for transplant, identify appropriate risk factors, um, and, you know, at, especially at a meeting like um, ASH, we continue to see ongoing ways to better risk stratify patients so we can really help them determine the appropriate timing for transplant, um, which is an ongoing challenge. I think the other thing that's of great interest is that there's a number of new therapeutic options coming out that people do question whether they will potentially change the course of the disease. Um, and I think these are very exciting. I think we have a lot of data that's accumulating showing their benefit. I think we still have to try to understand better which markers will help predict disease modification and how we're going to fit that into the whole paradigm of deciding the appropriate timing for transplant. But nonetheless, I think there's a lot of different therapeutic options coming out that will really make us think hard about how we are proceeding with transplant in patients. I think that, you know, if you, if you look at the shape of the ASH meeting, um, it's interesting. So you had a plenary session here with a very interesting novel agent that is targeting calreticulin. So we've been talking jack, 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 but now we are going to see what's happening if you target calreticulin and how that's going to change the shape of MPN. So that's a plenary session novel topic. But at the same time, I would say there's a lot at this meeting about the beginning, the middle, and perhaps the end of myelo proliferative diseases. So there's a lot about the entire journey hearing from, um, and I think one of my colleagues started to talk about inflammation and prevention and familial syndromes and what do you do even before the diseases explode, which I think would be very exciting for, for patients who may have a chance on the early end prior to progression of disease for potential interventions. Then in the middle, you have an awful lot of patients dealing with an awful lot of problems for many years, and we have agents to mitigate some of those symptoms, as well as potentially to change the course of disease. And I think that there is a progression of what can be done early, what symptom do you have, what drug do you need for what symptom, and then building on combinations, as was just um, alluded to. And then as you get toward the um, very, very symptomatic patients toward end-stage disease, I still think that becomes very, very difficult to manage, and we're all looking forward to trying to sort which drug, now that we have more than one, could possibly be side effect profile match to an individual patient. And then I would also um, like to repeat uh, what has been said by a colleague that we really don't know what to do about transplant. Transplant outcomes for our patients are not what they want them to, what we want them to be. I find myself saying in clinic all the time that transplant is the only curative option, but I don't actually want to send the patient to a transplant. So I think we're looking forward to how to make transplants safer for those patients who really do have a potential and a reality of cure, and yet make sure that we aren't sending MPN patients to transplant where there's going to be a lot of toxicity without finally getting to, um, to cure of the disease. I would echo what a lot of people have said in terms of the hope. I think there's so many new therapies, so many new discoveries coming about that will really help us not only treat people earlier, but also treat people better. Um, and hopefully at some point, there will be medication so they won't need my transplant services anymore, but I don't think that'll happen for a while. I think I've been quite invigorated by this year's ASH with lots of new new data. I think for MPN patients where I think we can be the most hopeful is in uh, the early stage MPNs where probably um, 
this watchful waiting is probably not going to, you know, not going to cut it anymore, whether it's with new drugs or potentially really focusing on lifestyle interventions, which from my perspective can be just as impactful or even more impactful than, than drugs. So that's, that's what I'm most hopeful about. And it's also a social event. I mean, many of us, like everybody in the world, felt that we weren't really having our community come together the same way and to be back in person and talk with one another, to collaborate on ideas, to remind myself that, oh yeah, Angela's studying that cool thing about inflammation. I'd like to read more of her papers. That kind of thing really happens face to face. So ASH 2022, like all of these annual meetings, is a chance to really um, get inspired again and make sure that we're uh, keeping our momentum going. Um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great meeting. So I come from a weird place called New York City where one of the actual grandfathers um, of NPN kind of hangs out and he's here at this ASH meeting. And what's fun for me is that Dr. Richard Silver, who is in his 90s and roaming around the hallways of ASH, started out a really long time ago using interferon for MPN patients and telling us now the stories of how he was called basically, I think everything from nuts on down from there and not getting a lot of traction in the field and having so little to offer patients, really very, very little in the way of any kind of therapy. There was a little bit of aspirin that became useful. There was a little bit of hydrea that became useful. And then there was some interferon. And now I think he's walking around pretty happy at ASH watching lots of interferon, lots of new drugs, a lot of optimism, um, patient symptom scores that are allowing patients to finally capture and tell us about what they're feeling so that we can accurately measure whether the drugs are working. So I think it's a measure of a really, really long road um, that has come before us and we're kind of hoping to take things forward in a very optimistic direction with novel therapies, novel science, um, and hopefully, hopefully a lot more to offer um, the MPN patients of the world. I think there's, uh, it's hard to pick just one thing I'm excited about from uh, this year's ASH or hopeful about. I think there are so many different things. Um, and I think maybe the big theme is variety for me, that there's, um, for a long time we were talking about really just JAK inhibitors or that being the most the biggest and most exciting thing was various different types of JAK inhibitors, which is still great. But now the fact that we're kind of digging deeper into the disease biology and, um, and coming up with other combinations and other completely different pathways and different cellular mechanisms to target um, and having such a wide variety of different things to offer different patients, since we know that this is not just one disease and it's so different for so many different people, I think the possibility of having those options is really exciting. I am also excited about so much of the great new research that's going on that was presented at ASH, many by my colleagues that I'm surrounded by who are all wonderful. Um, in pediatrics, I am particularly excited about um, some of the interferon preparations. And in fact, with one of my colleagues, Nicole Cousine, we're planning to open a trial where we will treat uh, children and young adults with this agent. Currently, it's typically prescribed and available and approved for older patients, 21 or 18 and above. Um, but it's a pretty remarkable um, therapy because we have seen that the allele burden, which means the number of mutant clones in our bloodstream, actually decrease. Um, and I think that's a super exciting result. The mechanisms for that are not completely worked out, but we're hoping to understand that. And we're really excited about um, being able to offer this treatment to young children because, you know, if we can get rid of the mutant clone in somebody who's 10 or 20, hopefully we can promise them 80 or 90 more years of life without MPN. And so that's something I'm very excited about. All I want to add to this is just, I think that the fact that MPN now, the thinking about it and the work on MPN is so central to ASH, and there are so many people working on it, I'm a big believer that these problems can be solved. And I think that uh, when there's so much resources and so many people are working in so hard to trying to solve it, it will get solved. So that's the hope.